With COVID cases on the rise again, here's what I would do if I were to get reinfected in 2024. My name is Eliana and I have been a long COVID patient since 2020. Goes without saying that none of this is medical advice. I am not saying that you need to do all of these things. I'm not prescribing any of them. I'm just saying this is what I would do because this is what I think makes sense for me. Okay, the first thing I would do is get on the phone with my doctor and get them to prescribe me Paxlovid. I know that certain medications that I already take on the daily are contraindicated with Paxlovid. So I would work with my doctor to make any adjustments to my daily medication to make sure that I could safely take the packs. And if possible, I would try to get my hands on more than a five day course of Paxlovid. That's just because there's more and more evidence that five days is simply not enough for lots of people. The last time I was infected was in 2022 and I was not testing negative at the end of my five day course of Paxlovid. We also have research from Stanford that says that a 15 day course is still considered safe. Sorry that the top of this article is cut off here. Next up, I would try to get my hands on some metformin. If I get my hands on, I mean, I would ask my doctor to prescribe it. I'm not suggesting that you do anything shady here. And the reason for that is because there is research to suggest that taking metformin during the acute phase of your COVID infection could reduce the risk of you developing long COVID. Then I would take an over-the-counter antihistamine such as Zizol or Levocetirazine, Zyrtec, otherwise known as Cetirazine, or any other H1 antihistamine. The reason for this is because when we are acutely infected with the virus, our mast cells tend to act up, so taking antihistamines can help reduce symptoms by calming down our mast cells. I would take an over-the-counter H2 block also an antihistamine, but it acts on H2 instead of H1, known as famotidine. Not only is famotidine going to help with that mast cell activation that I mentioned earlier, but there is also evidence to show that people who took famotidine during their acute infection experienced more rapid symptom resolution than people who did not take famotidine. Now, obviously the Paxlovid and the metformin, you need to get through your doctor because you need a prescription for it, but anything that's available over the counter, I have linked in my Amazon storefront under reinfection plan. In my next video, I'm going to talk about the nasal and oral rinses that I would use, and my third and final video, I'm going to talk about the supplements. So like and follow for more. Okay, this is part two of what I would do if I were to get reinfected with COVID. In my first video, I talked about all the medications that I would take. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the different oral and nasal rinses I would use. I'm a long COVID patient. I have been since 2020 and I've done a ton of research, but I am not a doctor. So always consult with your doctor first. This is not medical advice. This is simply what I think would make sense for me. Okay, every morning and night, I would do a saline nasal rinse. You don't need to use this brand. You can use any saline rinse brand or you can make your own saline solution at home, but this is linked in my Amazon storefront. Doing the saline rinse can help get any gunk and pathogens out of your nasopharyngeal passageway. And then about three or four times a day, but always after the saline rinse, I would use a xylitol nasal spray. Xylitol is both anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial and has been shown to shorten the viral shedding duration in asymptomatic COVID-19 positive subjects in one study. The two brands that I like are Zlear and Beekeepers Naturals. I would probably gravitate more towards the Beekeepers Naturals because it also has oregano and eucalyptus in it. I'm not so sure about eucalyptus, but I do know for a fact that oregano is antimicrobial as well, so it just gives that extra antiviral punch. And then finally, I would use a medicated gargle like the betadine sore throat gargle. Also linked to my Amazon storefront under reinfection plan. Probably gargle with this for 30 seconds at a time for two to three times a day. I would be careful with this, however, because it is an iodine gargle, which means that it has povidine iodine in it, which can impact your thyroid function if you use it for extended periods of time. So I would not use this for longer than a few days at a time. This also comes in spray form, by the way, and I do have that that travel spray as well. If you don't want to gargle with iodine, you can always use a CBC mouthwash or spray. I like this one by Crest. It's important to note that all of the studies on CBC helping to reduce viral load have been done on concentrations of 0.08%. So make sure whatever product you buy, it's 0.08%. Okay, that is it for the nasal and throat rinses. In my next and final video, I'm going to talk about the different supplements I would take if I were to be reinfected. Like and follow for more. Here is part three of what I would do if I were to get reinfected with COVID in 2024 as a long COVID patient. In part one, I talked about the medications I would take. In part two, I talked about the nasal and oral rinses I would use. And now I'm going to be talking about the different supplements I would take. Final disclaimer that this is not medical advice. I am not a doctor. I am simply sharing what I think makes sense for me. Rhythm Health, which is a virtual clinic that focuses on long COVID and post-viral care, actually has a nifty blog post on their site that suggests different supplements that you should take if you were to get reinfected. And 
personally, I would take all of these. I actually already have all of them on hand. I have them in my supply closet. That's just because I don't wanna be scrambling at the last minute if I do end up getting infected, especially if I'm not feeling well. I don't wanna be worrying about different things that I need to buy. So natokinase, not only has it been shown to have antiviral effects, but it also has anti-blood clotting effects, which is a very good thing with COVID because COVID does affect the blood vessels and has been shown to promote clotting. And acetylcysteine or NAC, very common supplement in the MECFS world that's supposed to help mitochondrial health as well as detoxification. Curcumin is anti-inflammatory and can help reduce symptoms. I already take that twice a day. A multivitamin with D3, as we know vitamin D is very important to support the immune system. Melatonin also has anti-inflammatory effects. Finally, we have alpha lipoic acid, which helps regulate your cardiovascular system. I have all of the specific brands that I like to use linked in my Amazon storefront under COVID reinfection plan. However, you do not need to take those specific brands. You can find cheaper brands. Any of them will work fine. Hopefully you won't need any of these tips and you will stay happy and healthy all summer long, but in case you do, I hope you found this helpful. Because a summer COVID wave is basically inevitable, I thought no better time to show you guys the different masks I wear for different occasions. Okay, so here they are in order of least risky to most risky situations. And really quick disclaimer, I'm not saying that this is perfect. This is simply what I've been doing and what I think makes sense. For relatively low risk situations like popping in and out of the post office or in and out of the pharmacy, I will use a KN95. And these are the two that I've been gravitating towards lately. This one is from XDX and comes in a few different colors, green, navy, red, gray, and black. I have these linked on my Amazon storefront and they do have the GB2626-2019 marker on them. Normally I wouldn't advocate for buying masks on Amazon, but I do feel a bit more comfortable buying these on Amazon because I buy them directly from the brand's official page. I also like these from Planet Halo. These were gifted to me and I didn't have very high expectations, but I think they're actually my favorite K95 because they do have this foam nose piece which makes for a much better fit and is also very comfortable my boyfriend also really likes these because he gets eczema around the nose and the foam piece is less harsh on his skin and doesn't irritate it the way that other masks do the one downside to the planet halo mask versus the xdx mask is that as you can see it juts out just the tiniest bit more so if you really don't like the duck face look, then I, I would say get the XDX, but for me, it, it doesn't really make a difference and these I find more comfortable. And the specific style of this KN95, I think is called the Kingfa, K-I-N-G-F-A. And I will link the brand Planet Halo down in the description box. For riskier situations, like for example, a few weeks ago, I went to a Broadway play that was very crowded and we were there for about two hours. I use my tried and true 3M Aura, which also has the sort of foam nose piece that makes for a better seat. I believe studies have been done on this mask that have shown that this creates the best fit for the largest majority of people, which doesn't surprise me because my boyfriend and I have very different facial features and this fits me basically perfectly and it fits him basically perfectly as well. The only thing that I don't like about the 3M Aura is that it is white. Like, come on. 3M, you can do better, give us more color options. I order mine in bulk at Home Depot. Okay, so for the highest risk situations, for example, a couple of years ago, I had a semi-long-term hospital stay in the middle of a COVID surge. I use this elastometric Envo mask. In my opinion, this creates as close to a perfect seal as humanly possible because it has this sort of like jelly-like plastic all around the edges of the mask. And when I wear this, I don't feel any air along the edges going in or out. This is on the pricier side. I paid about $80 for this a couple of years ago, and it does come with quite a few replaceable filters. All right, that's all. Let me know if you have any questions. Tanning is one of the most dangerous beauty trends. So why do people do it? Let's talk about it. In pre-industrial Europe, pale skin was associated with wealth because it meant that you could afford to stay inside all day. Unlike the working class who had to work outside in the fields where they would develop a tan, people would go to all kinds of lengths to stay pale, including using parasols and giant hats and even wearing lead-based makeup. This started to change because of the Industrial Revolution. Now, the working class was working indoors in factories, and instead it was the rich who had the time and money to go on vacation and develop a tan. 
Another factor was that in the early 20th century, doctors and scientists started to report on the medical benefits of sunlight for curing certain diseases. This led to the invention of phototherapy, which won the Nobel Prize in 1903. By the 1920s, tanning was a mainstream beauty trend, and this spurred the creation of the tanning industry, which would create tons of different products and methods for tanning, including tanning oils, fake tans, and indoor tanning beds. I wonder if tanning will be the next target of public health advocacy in the way that tobacco was. We've known for decades that exposure to UV radiation, whether it's from the sun or indoor tanning beds, causes skin cancer. And in the last five years, there seems to have been a pro-sunscreen, anti-tanning backlash, largely because of the popularity of skincare routines and K-beauty. What's your favorite sun protection hack? Mine is that I'm chronically online and I never go outside. Let us know in the comments. And until next time, bye. We devoted ourselves to this yeah. chronically yeah. undervalued art form because we know so how special and how meaningful it is. The entertainment world depends on the power of what we do. We know that, they know that, we know our worth. So let's fight together for our future. All right, everyone, one more thing before we wrap this meeting up. It's been brought to my attention by our intern, Rebecca. We still have to plan the fall plus size collection for the year. Oh, why? I thought they were going to be on Ozempic or something. No, apparently they're not taking the medication. So yes, we still have to keep designing the clothes for the fatties. Okay, so we're all pissed, but I think we can knock this out in like five minutes. Let's just get this done, okay? Give me your best ideas, or maybe even mediocre. Well, you know a lot of the fatties live in the South, so what if we did like Western clothes, but made them like pastel? Like really pastel. I wear we love it, but can we make the tops cold shoulder? It's actually not really in style, and it hasn't been, so like maybe we could try cold shoulder tops. Not in style. Come on, Rebecca, that was, that was funny. That was funny. Keep them coming, James. Keep them coming. That was good. Eh, cottage court seems a little risky. It might be a little too trendy for them. You can put that like for like the 2034 cycle or something like that. I, I, I feel like we're just not going, we're not staying true to what our customers want. So what if we, I don't even know if I can say it, I'm scared. Cultural or top floral details that create a skull. Wow, you're a genius. Mm -hmm. I love it, boss, mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. And like a really like cheap like cotton jersey material that'll like pill immediately the first time you wash it. They're gonna eat it up because like what else do they not eat up? Am I right? <laughs> Rebecca, work this up, send it over to marketing and uh, the manufacturing whatever they do to make these fatties clothes, and let's get out of here, boys. I don't know if you thought that you ate with that. To fill y'all in, I made a video about basically white academics gentrifying black culture, and I think this commenter is implying that. I am doing the same thing by wearing my hair in these braids in my previous video. Awkward moment when you learn that my ancestors wore braids like this. On my mother's side from Guatemala, we descend from the Maya. So leave black people alone. And even if my ancestors did not wear their hair like this, y'all are so obsessed with trying to frame us black people as like gentrifiers, or colonizers or oppressors and it's a weird weird obsession i've noticed so millie bobby brown ended up getting a wax figure looks exactly like her and post malone's looks more like post malone than post malone i'm gonna show y'all a few more and let me see if y'all get the pattern here's a wax figure that they did last year of little wayne I'd be angry too. And here's one of Naomi Campbell. I don't even understand. This one's my favorite. This one is of Nicki Minaj. And this one is of Vin D I mean, The Rock. The Rock. And at first I was just like, well, you know, wax figures are hard to do. So maybe it's just a coincidence that all the black ones look bad. But when I seen this one, I just realized they just not trying for black folk. Like, look at this one of LeBron. Bro look like a 2K player from like 2011. This is why we can't respect the industry and we got to do our own. Repent. These can't be the blushes y'all love.
If she doesn't like it, I'm not wearing it and I don't care. We need to start putting way more respect on Gloria's name because one thing she will do for us is be the villain. When she says stuff like that, I always look at her like, damn girl, like you're not risking like brands getting mad at you and like maybe wanting to stop working with you and stuff. And it's like, no. The same way people are in an uproar talking about how white people, white influencers who say the N word need to be like canceled so hard that other white creators are scared of saying it. Makeup companies need to be scared of releasing products that don't fit everyone. If a product says universal and I buy it and I go home, I don't spend my money and I'm beating my face, I put my blush on and it's giving ash and you said it was universal, why am I not included in the universal? That's not, that doesn't make any sense. Hey everyone, this is Bisan and these are some updates about yesterday's massacre, the worshippers massacre. So, um, the civil defense did not find any completed body, no completed bodies for more than 100 people are killed. Uh, even burnt bodies they did not find. So, they had to do this. They gathered human pieces um, in, in, uh, in bags, in plastic bags. And um, since the average weight for a normal human is 70 kilometer, kilograms, let, let, let us say, they uh, gathered every 70 kilograms in one plastic bag, uh, bag and handle the bag to the uh, relatives or to the family who are still alive. And for children, they gathered um, between 30 to 35 kilograms of human pieces in each bag. So they handle it also to the mothers, fathers, or the relatives. But despite this, they did not find enough human pieces. This is simply because of the new weapon that the Israeli army used to commit this massacre. The army dropped three bombs. Uh, each bomb uh, weighed uh, more than 2,000 pounds. So that's 6,000 pounds over a close and a small place and crowded place. And the heat of the explosion was more than 7,000 uh, Silesian degrees. So the human uh, uh, bodies and pieces melted, melted, melted. If this is not a holocaust, if this is not a genocide, then please tell me what. Please tell me what, I'm just waiting for any answers. This is the first update. The second one is that the Israeli army is trying all the time to mislead you and to tell you that these shelters, these mosques, these schools are uh, using uh, used by Hamas. And this time, I mean, they, they, they said that after the bombing of schools in Sirat, the bombing of school in Dir, schools in Dir al-Balah, and much more. But this time, they did not lie in a perfect way. They missed something because they, they, they provided a list telling that these are the Hamas members who were killed in, in that uh, uh, bomb and uh, bombing or targeting of, of this mosque of the worshippers Al Fajr prayer. Then appeared that they've, they've published the same names before. So these people, the listed people, were killed as them before in another massacre. Another massacre. And then the resistance groups and Hamas and all the political parties in uh, uh, Palestine announced that no fighters, no resistance fighters are between civilians or among civilians. Okay, they were told to be uh, away from any civilian place, civilian, civilian shelter, so the Israelis don't have an excuse to kill the civilians. They are lying. The third update is that the Security Council is uh, uh, holding a meeting today to talk about this massacre. But we know, I know, and you know that they will not do anything because these massacres are ongoing for 10 months. I mean, started with the Ma'madani massacre, killing, killing more than 500 people, uh, to um, Khan Yunus al Mawasi massacre, to Nsirat massacre, and other massacres. So. They will not do anything. You need to stop Israel. You need to boycott Israel. You need to tell Israel that it is a genocidal state that needs to to get out of Palestine because it's an occupation. That's it. What you're about to see is something that so few people alive have seen and heard, but that every single person should. 
Last year, I had the opportunity to go to Hiroshima, Japan for work. And while I was there, I had the incredible honor and privilege of being able to meet with a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Her name is Toshiko Tanaka, and she was just six years old when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Now, my native language is Japanese. Hers, of course, is as well. So we got the opportunity to converse just the two of us for over an hour. And the discussion that we had is something that will never ever leave me. I think about it every day. But she also worked really hard with help to write her experience out in English and practiced delivering it so that you would be able to hear her experience as well. And she let me record that so that I would be able to share it with you. So here is Toshiko sharing her story. Hello, my name is Toshiko Tanaka. I survived the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. I've been creating enamel mural artwork for over 50 years. It wasn't easy for me to talk about what had happened in Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. I thought people would not understand me. I was traumatized and not able to talk to anybody about my personal experience of the atomic bombing, not even to my own family. I started to open up and share this horrible experience when I turned 70. I went, I went to Venezuela on peace boat 15 years ago and met Mr. Toledo, the mayor of the city of La Guayla. He said to me, as a survivor of the atomic bombing, you have a responsibility to talk about what happened that really touched my heart. Originally, my family lived only 500 meters from ground zero, where the bomb hit. But just one week before the atomic bombing, we moved 2.3 kilometers away from ground zero. Because of this, I am alive today. Even though I was burned and exposed to radiation, when I was when I was just six years old, the gigantic, gigantic mushroom cloud was right above me. At 8.15 a.m., I was on my way to school. Somebody shouted, B-29, the enemy bomber. I looked up and saw a tremendous flash. It was like a million lights. Everything went white. I couldn't see. I covered my face with my right arm. Heat burned my head my neck and my right arm. Then suddenly everything went dark, like night time. Hot sand dust blew up. It covered the sun. I couldn't see. My mouth was full of dust. What was happening? What should I do? I can't forget that terrible crunchy sand taste. Soon my burned arm began to swell. The pain was incredible. I cried all the way home, but our house was very damaged. When I got there, even though my mother was alive, she could not recognize me. My hair was burned. I was covered in ash. My clothes were destroyed. That night, I was close to death. Survival depended on how strong you were and how lucky. My younger, my younger sister had bad head wounds. Our roof was mostly gone. But suddenly, I looked up and saw a small patch of blue sky. Although I was in pain, I thought, this is so beautiful. That blue sky stayed with me. It had given me the will to live. And if the heavens said, don't worry, there will be a tomorrow. This is why I continue to live life positively, even through many hardships. It took only one second for a single bomb to destroy the city of Hiroshima and 140,000 lives. All my former classmates were killed. My young aunt left home that morning and never came back. Her body was never found. 
every image of that terrible day remains. My generation will be the last to tell you about this event as direct witnesses. This is what I saw. After I got home that day, I saw a large crowd of dying people. They were walking in procession near my house. Some were orphans. Men, women, and children alike were almost naked with burned clothes. They walked in silence with outstretched arms. Burned pearl skin hung from the tips of their fingers. They were like ghosts. Even today, whenever I see barbecue, barbecued tomatoes, it reminds me of that terrible scene of death. Like tomatoes, human skin peels off easily when burned. Later, something weird started to happen. Like tomatoes, human skin peels off easily when burned. Later, something weird started to happen. People with no injuries started to die right in front of our house. No one knew them, but they had been exposed to massive radiation. I have another strong memory of that time. I was unconscious for a few days. When I woke up, there was a strong smell in the air. It was like burning rotten fish. Even now, I can still smell it. But the smell wasn't in fish. It was the smell of human bodies being cremated in city parks and school grounds. Even though our family had nothing, my mother sheltered many people in our house. One was her cousin, Kenzo Matsuki. He came to our house with a burnt bucket containing the skull of a woman he wished to bury. The skull belonged to his aunt. His aunt was burned alive in her own house. I also remember a 15-year-old girl who came to our house. On her back, she carried her badly burned younger sister. The burned girl survived, but the old girl did not. She had been exposed to massive radiation. My husband's uncle was an English teacher and a devout Christian. He used to paint the beautiful big pictures and believed in peace. But the bomb killed him, and all his six family members, including his baby. Grieving their loss, my husband adopted his uncle's family name, Tanaka. My husband has now died, but I still carry this last name. In those days, the city of Hiroshima and the surface of the rivers, which ran through the city, were entirely covered by people's bodies. There were also 12 young American prisoners of war in Hiroshima. They also died from the bomb, dropped by their own country. Later, after finding this out, I started to feel urgency to research about what happened after the bomb. As time passed, the wounds of my skin became less visible. But the emotional wounds and the da damage from the radioactivity remained. Do you know the famous story of Sadako and her paper cranes? Sadako was four years younger than me, and we went to the same school. She survived the atomic bomb when she was two years old, but died of leukemia at the age, 12, age, age of 12. There were many other children like Sadako. In my case, radiation symptoms started when I was 12. My white blood cell count was abnormal. I suffered constant fever and fatigue, and sometimes fainted. I always had mouth ulcers and blotches around my mouth. It was hard to eat. Even today, 
when I am very tired, I have painful sores and can't bleed. I sometimes bleed from my colon. I have had bone fracture three weeks, uh, knee surgery and cataract surgery. In those days, Hibakusho women had trouble marrying because their babies often had birth defects. Fortunately, I was able to marry and had a happy family life. My husband did not seem to mind that I was a Hibakusha. But when our first child was born, he was scared. He seriously checked the baby's fingers and the toes. Then I realized that he had been worried about the damage, damage the bum on, uh, on a baby. Not just my husband, but all parents those days were worried. Nobody on this planet should suffer this same tragedy. Since 2007, I have made four round the world voyages on peace boat, which is sponsored by a Japan-based international NGO. I learned more about the situation of the world during these voyages. I have visited more than 80 countries, including one that suffered in tragic war wars, and one that suffered damage from climate change. I learned that nuclear weapons will lead the Earth to destruction. They are inhumane and should never be allowed on Earth. Last year, 2022, Russian President Putin invaded Ukraine, killing many civilians and causing disastrous da damage to the land. He also suggested the use of nuclear weapons for a survivor, who knows the inhumane tragedy caused by those weapons? This is totally unacceptable, and I feel strong anger. The global community must cooperate to stop this outrage. Otherwise, it could lead to the end of the Earth. There are many people working tirelessly for a nuclear-free world like you. For instance, for instance, I can is a global campaign to promote the abolishment of nuclear weapons. As you know, because of ICANN's contribution, TPNW Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was adopted on July 7, 2017, and it was awarded 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. However, none of nuclear states and their allies, including Japan, has supported the treaty. I urge the leaders of the nuclear weapon states and other nations not to dismiss the TPNW as idealistic, but to listen to the voice of people and think about it again, I hope they think about create, creating peace, not going to war. We are the crew members of a ship called Planet Earth. If the crew members fight each other for better food and place, the ship will sink, and none of us will survive. Now is the time for us to help each other and create peace through diplomacy. Last month, I was invited to the U.S. with my daughter to give, the, uh, give, to give testimony at seven venues, including Yale University, the University of Connecticut, and Wesleyan University. I was impressed by the reaction from the audience who gave, gave us a standing ovation and a lot of questions and comments. I feel that young people in the United States 
are coming more and more aware of the dangers of nuclear weapons in the current situation. I look forward that to, to their future actions. I know one day we will live in a nuclear-free world and the beautiful blue sky will continue to shine above the heads of our future generation. Thank you for your kind attention.